Um, of course, let's talk Tottenham because I mentioned there the big breaking news as you walk through the door to join Simon and myself is that Newcastle, the, the, the whole landscape at Newcastle United is about to change. Will that impact on your former club? Will that impact on the Arsenals of this world, the Leicesters? Because Newcastle are about to become super rich. Well, look, it's got to, I think, Jim. It's got to just because, as you say, I mean, it's a... It's a great club, Newcastle, with a great history. I yeah. think, you know, you know, I feel like for the fan base, they deserve something like this where they've got some ownership coming in that's going to spend the money. I think they've been a bit of a sleeping giant in that respect. Uh, and of course, there's a knock-on effect. If you've got the wealth of the Saudi Arabia behind you, then all of a sudden, those clubs that are perhaps on the fringes of that top four are thinking, oh dear, what does this mean for us? Yeah. What does it mean for them? I mean, I just it, think it's going to life's more, going to be a lot more tough with just, another big one at the top. Yeah, it's just another competition, is it? It's someone with deep pockets. And again, you know, if I think of my old club Spurs, it's a club that's always tried to run with a model. It's tried to run with a pay structure. And then another club coming in that's basically going to spend what it takes to have success just makes it all that more difficult. Yeah. I mean, you're what a fan of what Daniel's what be, done, aren't yeah, you, Yeah, I mean, what would be the reaction? I mean, you, you obviously, you would have come across my cash, I suspect, yeah. Um, yeah. at various times, whether it's because he's Paul Kemsley's mate or whether it's because of his relationship with Daniel. What do you think happens for Newcastle now? I mean, obviously, Mike's been vilified, and whether that's justified or not is for other people to perhaps observe on. But I worry that it becomes hyperinflation as a result of a club that's going to cut, an owner that's going to come into Newcastle that's got profits for the last three years, the financial fair play isn't going to be a burden for them for the next three years, so they can really go for it. They'll pay top money for players, which will drag everybody up again. What would be the reaction in boardrooms like Tottenham that have held on to players like Harry Kane, not cashed that chip in for 125 million quid? There's arguments being run about how Tottenham were, were a brilliant club three years ago mm. with wage structures huge profits, big stadiums, but now we haven't got a team that's competing. What, how will people like Daniel view this in your mind's eye? Well, look, I think firstly, I mean, it's right about Mike. I mean, he, he's he's run with a philosophy, so whether you like it or not, he had a philosophy yeah. and they stuck to it. I think now the interesting thing is going to be in terms of the backers, who's actually going to be running the club and, you know, because there is that danger. We've seen it, and Simon, you've seen it mm. in your time as well. New ownership comes in. There's sometimes a trans a period where, you know, it takes them time to get up to speed and get they do some crazy deals. People, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Get your trousers pulled down a few times. Yeah. And I think everyone would admit it. You know, even Danny, if you spoke to yeah. him, would have said, you know, in that first sort of year, he learns a lot. And so I do think it's going to be a lot about who they're going to bring in to actually run the club on the day-to-day -day because that's going to have a big impact. But I think, you know, there'll be a concern. I mean, I... Because there were allegations that a cartel was formed behind the scenes of six clubs, which your old mob would be part of, that didn't want Newcastle to get this opportunity and were influencing. I'm not asking you to comment on whether they were or they weren't. But do you think it will send a shockwave or you just think they'll say, it is what it is and it's we need to focus on what we're doing rather than worrying about what they're doing? Well, look, that would be my advice would be to focus. I think, you know, you can't get distracted. So there's always going to be, you know, different clubs doing different things. I think the most important thing when you're running a club is to have your vision, your philosophy and stick to it. But I do think, um, to the point I was saying to Jim earlier, it does mean there's more competition. I mean, yep. you can't doubt that now. You know, mm -hmm. a Newcastle under Mike Ashley, a Newcastle with Saudi Arabia money behind it is a different competition. So yeah. that'll be the, the sort of ramifications that'll be going around the sort of Premier League clubs today. Dan, of course, you were Tottenham's director of football administration. You worked very closely with Daniel Levy. Um, Simon knows Daniel very well. I know him not to the same degree as Simon. You know him better than all of us. When you heard the news breaking and you were across the other side of the Atlantic, Harry Kane, is he out of there? Is he going to be Manchester City? Did you think Daniel wouldn't sell him? I did. I mean, I've had a couple of experiences. Obviously, Luka Modric was a good example of a player that wanted out, you know, with Chelsea. And, uh, you know, we as a club said that wasn't going to happen and it didn't happen. So, I mean, the one thing you know with Daniel is he never bluffs. You know, if he says he's not going to do something, then you know that he's followed through before. So, I think even when there was that talk and... Uh, going around there, I was pretty sceptical that it was going to happen just because, you know, knowing how important Harry was for, for Tottenham and given Daniel's sort of personality and the way that he deals with yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Is, is he the tough negotiator, maybe the toughest in the Premier League that we're led to believe he is? He is. Look, he's a really smart guy. I mean, I think he sometimes gets a bad rap. I mean, in terms of his, he cares for Tottenham. You know, he spent a lot of time building that club out. You've only got to see the stadium that will have the pleasure of playing the American football game in on Sunday. But, you know, that's something that has been built up over time. So I do think he cares deeply about the club. Uh, I think he has a philosophy and he hasn't overspent. You know, 
for me, it was the best training I could have got to go into a salary cap environment because it was almost like we had a self-imposed cap. But I'll be honest, like he was tough, but I had Jeremy Peace before that at West Brom. And I'd argue he was just as tough, but yeah. not as high a profile. So I think, you know, the Premier League's got some tough people in it. Simon's sitting across me now, you know, yeah. this is a league that breeds sort of people that are He's know, a smart, cat, smart, who've been, you know, clever in business. So yeah. there's a lot of tough negotiators out there, but Daniel's certainly one of the better ones. But the fact of the matter is, and the statistic speaks for itself, one trophy in 20 years. Not good enough, is it? Look, it's a difficult one. I know that that's what the supporters care about. You know, at the end of the day, they don't care about the balance sheet. They don't care about, you know, what percentage of turnover you're spending on wages. They want to see trophies. And I think that's the difficult balance that you've got to have. And that's the bit, I say, again, I say when, you know, Newcastle now, if it looks like they're going to have some money to compete, that just makes it all the more difficult. Yeah. Dan, before you go today, and I'm intrigued by this, uh, American owners here in the Premier League, the Glazers, Stan, Cr- Stan Kroenke, John W. Henry, how are they viewed over there? Yeah, so they have their, so you know, if you take someone like Stan, he's got a number of clubs um, in America. I think, you know, the, the Liverpool is famously with the Red Sox. They had success under John Henry, so, you know, they were revered for that, but it's a... Uh, you know, it's a high bar then. Once you have success, people want success to continue. The Red Sox actually won a big game against the Yankees in the playoffs uh, yesterday. I think I've lost track traveling, but so, you know, they're back on the up again. So I think, you know, I think they, they're they appreciated. But, um, you know, what I would say, and I'll shout out for what we've done at Atlanta and Arthur Blank. You know, Arthur Blank is someone that absolutely cares about the city. 95% of everything that is made uh, is going to his foundation when he dies. So this is something where all of the fans in Atlanta know that he cares about the city. And for me, that's the vision and that's the the success we have with our you know average crowds of 53,000. It's partly because we have an owner where the whole city knows that this is a guy that cares about the city and cares about trophies. You know, yeah. we've won three trophies in our first four years, you know, the most trophies in that period, because ultimately that's what sport's about. It's about winning those championships. And you want to be a big part of the 2026 World Cup, don't you? Absolutely. And we really hope so. With the and you're going to be. Stadium. I think so, yeah. We can't count our chickens, but I'm feeling pretty confident. But he's pushing the club forward and you, Dan, will no doubt be doing the same. Yeah, that's the hope, yeah. And I think, you know, with the league, it's going to be rocket fuel for Major League Soccer having the World Cup in 2026. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we can get those broadcast revenues up. Yeah. We can start to compete with some of these top European clubs. Jim White and Simon Jordan. Monday to Thursday morning, 10 till 1. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.